Israeli ground troops joined heavy missile and artillery barrages in southern Lebanon today in what was the, the ninth Lebanese day of Israel's military increasing international pressure to rein in Hezbollah. But UN Secretary Kofi Annan called for an immediate ceasefire in the Middle East while plans for a lasting peace are implemented. Every week we hear about troubles in Israel and Palestine. Suicide bombings, car bombs and shootings seem to be an almost daily occurrence. Many consider the situation to be impossible to resolve. Others try, but have so far failed to produce any lasting peace. But how has the situation become so bad? Why did the fighting start in the first place? And will it ever be resolved? In this film, we will look at the origins of the troubles in the Middle East examine the role of the Lord Jesus Christ in the problem and explain how God has a plan for lasting peace not only in the Middle East but the whole world. God's plan is centered on the nation of Israel and we have the chance to be part of it if we want to be. Many Christians often refer to the teachings of Jesus and the contents of the New Testament but ignore the old, considering this to simply be the book of the Jews. But if you think about it, Jesus was a Jew who lived in Israel and frequently referred back to Old Testament prophecies. The Old Testament contains the history of the nation of Israel, which helps us make sense of the current situation and also prophecies about their future. Jesus lived in Israel, right at the center of the earth's land masses, in the place that God had especially chosen. This is a strategic location, as it sits right in between Europe, Asia and Africa. It has often been tramped through by invading armies on their way to the north or south of the area. It's no wonder that it remains a fiercely contested part of the planet today, God's choice of this land was deliberate. He referred to it as a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. God chose a location right at the center of the world to place his people. God chose to use the Jewish people to reveal his plan of salvation for all mankind. Its central component was his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not born in Washington, London or Moscow, but Israel. Due to its location at the centre of three of the world's continents 2,000 years ago, this was the ideal place for the Saviour to be born. It's little wonder that the rise of Christianity spread so rapidly through Asia and Europe. It was the ideal launch pad. 2,000 years on, people are still watching Israel, including the ongoing dispute between the Palestinians. Just as the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus took place at the centre of the earth, so the final phase of God's purpose will happen there. Jesus and the Jews are scheduled to meet in Jerusalem, when they will at last accept him as their saviour and messiah. He will rescue them from their troubles and once again make them the centerpiece of God's plan for the world. God has a plan which is now in its final phase. So why should the nation of Israel be the key to world peace? The history of the Jewish people is unlike any other nation. Called to be the people of God, they have endured more turmoil and travail than any other people. So why has God persevered with a nation that often appeared unwilling to go along with his purpose? The people of Israel became a nation 
whilst they were slaves in Egypt and were rescued from there by a Hebrew called Moses who had been brought up as an Egyptian. After a traumatic few years wandering, God settled them in a land and gave them a distinctive law and form of worship. In this time, they became a kingdom. God chose their kings and directed their national life, bringing them good or bad experiences according to their behaviour. When things were bad, he allowed their enemies to overrun them and eventually deport them. First, the northern tribes were taken to Assyria, and then the southern ones to Babylonia, which is modern-day Iraq. The kingdom ended then, and was never re-established with a king. All through their checkered history, the nation of Israel had longed for a deliverer who would save them from all their troubles. Old Testament prophecies foretold a coming king who would reign in Israel for a long time and be triumphant and victorious in everything. Here is just one of those prophecies. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform. Whenever they were in trouble, the Jews would turn to promises like these and then would look for their Messiah. When the Messiah did come in the form of Jesus, he had to deal with a bigger problem than that of national sovereignty or political independence. Jesus came to deal with the worldwide problem of sin, the greatest enemy of all and one which affects everyone. However, the Jews were simply looking for their Messiah to overthrow their current oppressors, the Romans. They were less interested in the kingdom of God, which Jesus talked about, and were more interested in the kingdom of Israel. So they rejected God's Messiah and conspired to have him crucified by the Romans. But why choose Israel? Quite simply, the nation of Israel was representative of all mankind. What they did, we would have done too, given the opportunity. Everyone puts their national and self-interests first. That's why the world is still at war. So why did God choose Israel and not America or Britain or whatever our national identity is? Here's the answer. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is a God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face, to destroy them. He will not be slack with him who hates him, he will repay him to his face. God chose Israel because he loves them. He had sworn a solemn oath to their forefathers about their descendants. He had brought them out from Egypt when they were slaves. God keeps his promises and he demands love from his people. God made some promises to a man called Abram who was the forefather of Israel. The promises were, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The land of Canaan is Israel. They would possess the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Moreh. And the Canaanites were then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. There was one special descendant who would bring victory over all their enemies. 
By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. This was Jesus. The final promise was accompanied by an oath. For when he made them, God swore to Abram that it would be so. This is why God chose Israel as a nation, so that Abraham would have many descendants, both those by birth and those who were from other nations who would follow his faithful example. He was to become father of all those who believe in the promises of God. The Apostle Paul tells us this in his letter to the Galatians, that there would be one special descendant born of Abraham's line, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. One of the big questions to be resolved in the Middle East is that of territory and land ownership. The question is the same for Gaza, the West Bank, Jerusalem and the entire land known as Israel. Everybody is arguing about ownership and rights of occupation. Palestinians maintain that the land is theirs as they have occupied it for 2,000 years and this gives them absolute title. They say they have been ousted from their land by force. The Israelis point out that they were there first, from about 1400 BC until they were displaced in 70 and 132 AD. They claim they have purchased large tracts of land from previous occupiers. They say they haven't just taken it. The situation has been further complicated by various wars. The Six-Day Middle East War echoes along a second front, the diplomatic struggle at the United Nations Security Council. In 1947, the UN voted to petition the land between the Jews and the Arabs. However, the Palestinians refused to recognize the State of Israel, and Israel began claiming back Palestinian occupied parts of the land as their own. What we are left with today is a complicated and dangerous position of stalemate with neither side willing to compromise. On top of this, there is the problem of Jerusalem. The Palestinians want to make this their capital, but the city is sacred to three religions, the Jews, Christians and Muslims. In any political settlement that might be reached, one important consideration is likely to be overlooked. All land belongs to God. He formed it, and he alone owns it. As the psalmist observed, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. And as the Apostle Paul once said, God has given the nations a right for occupation, but not forever. God who made the world and everything in it, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord. There is a time coming, and all indications are that it will come quite quickly, when God will call all nations to account for the way they have occupied his earth. We are told he will destroy those who destroy his earth when he sends his king to reign here. Then the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ and he shall reign forever. We have already seen that the things that happened in Israel were designed to be helpful and educational to all nations, which is why God chose land for his nation to occupy right in the centre of the earth. The laws God gave them made it clear that theirs was a conditional right of possession, not an absolute one. Their right of possession was dependent upon their behaviour, 
just as our prospects of long-term survival in God's kingdom on earth are dependent on our behaviour before God. Israel's right of possession, and later their rights to other privileges, depended upon their obedience. God was a very tolerant and long-suffering landlord, and he accepted many of his tenants' failures. Even when the situation seemed hopeless, God tried to bring his people to their senses. They were deported, Israel in the north to Assyria, Judah in the south to Babylon, but only for 70 years. When the next generation returned, God sent them further prophets and gave them support in their attempts to re-establish a relationship with him. 400 years later, there was an even greater chance to find a better way forward. It was in Bethlehem, near to Jerusalem, that God's Son was born to the Virgin Mary. It was the greatest opportunity ever given to Israel to come back to God. Jesus explained that he had come to bring them back to God. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But Israel did not accept Jesus as their Messiah. Jesus was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But they did not recognize him. And instead, they killed the shepherd that was sent to save them. In a parable which Jesus told during the last weeks of his ministry, he spoke of some tenants of a vineyard who had repeatedly failed to give what was due to the landlord. Jesus said that a new tenancy was now to be given. He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. Thus it came about, exactly as Jesus foretold, and thirty years after his execution, the Jewish people were overrun by the Romans. First, the inhabitants of Galilee, and then the rebel army in Jerusalem. The exile scattered them all over the world in search of refuge and recognition. What followed was nearly 2,000 years of persecution, which led to the concentration camps where six million Jews perished, just because they were Jewish. It was the grimmest imaginable outworking of the ancient curse. Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples, from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. And among those nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you, you shall fear day and night, and have no assurance of life. In the morning you shall say, Oh, that it were evening, and at evening you shall say, Oh, that it were morning, because of the fear which terrifies your heart, and because of the sight which your eyes see. In May 1948, David Ben-Gurion stood up in the library in Tel Aviv to declare the state of Israel re-established. It was the end of a remarkable process, but more amazingly still, it was the very thing that had been predicted by the prophets thousands of years before. The Jewish people were back in their ancient land. The prophets had foretold that after the Jews were scattered throughout the earth into every nation, they would eventually return to a desolate and unfruitful land. They were destined to inhabit it and make it fruitful and fertile once again. That is what the prophets had foretold. In 1948, the Jews returned to the land just as God said they would. The mechanisms that brought about their return have to do with political movements and national decisions. 
But their return is not the result of human actions alone. Everything that has happened was overseen and directed by God. God never leaves himself without people who witness to his purpose. Long ago, he chose the Jewish people to be his witness to all nations. As the prophet Isaiah explained, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. The whole of God's purpose is bound up in the future of the Jewish people. The Lord Jesus made that plain, and so did the apostles, even the one who was specifically the apostle to the Gentiles. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you, to see you and speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise our twelve tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. As we said earlier, the Jews represent the action of all mankind, and they are no worse than the rest of us. What happened to them is that they were closer to God than any other nation and had a higher calling to be God's representatives on earth. Alas, they failed, and as a result, they had to endure 2,000 years of suffering. The prophet Jeremiah foretold the worldwide dispersion and the eventual regathering of the Jews. Therefore do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from afar, and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, and be quiet, and no one shall make him afraid. For I am with you, says the Lord, to save you. Though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. But I will correct you in justice, and will not let you go altogether unpunished. The prophet Ezekiel predicted the changes that have now occurred to the productivity and development of the land. But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. For I, indeed I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it, and the city shall be inhabited, and the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times, and do better for you than at your beginnings. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. The prophets described the political environment that was to exist when the Jews returned to the land. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. All these predictions have come true, or are coming true. The Jews have returned to their land, but they have been subjected to more pressure and difficulty than any other nation has ever experienced. The tinderbox of the Gaza Strip on the Negev Desert flares as intermittent guerrilla warfare rages with daily rain. From the Declaration of Independence onwards, the Israelis have been under attack from nations around them and they have had to fight to survive. But are they still the people of God? Or is God working through them to bring about his purpose despite them? Are they like scaffolding around a building, necessary for the construction phase, then dismantled and taken away when the work is completed? How can a nation which is largely humanist and unbelieving be called the people of God? What has to happen next? During the 19th century, the dream of a Jewish return to their ancient land was revived and given political momentum. Theodor Herzl was an Austro-Hungarian Jew who was a journalist, and he began to mobilize Jewish opinion by arranging a series of Zionist conventions 
the first in Baal, Switzerland. It was his conviction that the time had come to marshal public opinion and persuade politicians that getting the Jews back home would be good for them and good for the world. In 1896, Herzl published The Jewish State. It was not a biblical pamphlet, far from it. God and his prophecies were nowhere to be seen. Instead, it was a straightforward political appeal for a new Jewish state. It was an uphill struggle, but things began to move in the right direction. Some very rich Jews purchased land in Palestine and encouraged Jews to settle there and farm the land. Some began to move back as settlers. A Jewish chemist, Chaim Weissmann, made a discovery which was a valuable contribution to the British military success in the First World War. He was rewarded when the British government made the Balfour Declaration in 1917 to say that they would support the re-establishment of a Jewish presence in Palestine. Anti-Jewish feelings continued to run high in many countries, leading to Adolf Hitler's attempt to exterminate the entire race. When six million Jews perished in the gas chambers of Europe, the world's conscience was stirred as never before. The UN voted to petition the land between Jew and Arab, Russia and America agreeing that it was the best solution. None of this was obviously the work of God, but indeed it was. God works behind the scenes to accomplish his purpose, and thus his ancient nation was reborn. The provisional government brought into existence hastily in 1948 was a humanist and socialist one. There was no recognition of God's purpose. So how could God allow a faithless people to regain possession when they had lost possession in the first place because of their faithlessness? The answer tells us a lot about the God of the Bible and his marvellous kindness towards people who are in great need of his help even when they don't recognize that need. For nearly 2,000 years, God has waited and watched, but now he is taking action. It is the first step in the process of regaining control of the world and its government. The Jews are back in their ancient land because prophecy needs them to be there for the return from heaven of their king, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was once asked to foretell the signs that would lead to his return. This is what he said. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Long before Jesus was born, and so well before his missionary began, but the prophets had foretold that he would be rejected by the Jews. Nothing takes God by surprise. There was an offer of a rebirth for the nation of Israel 2,000 years ago, but they rejected it. When Jesus returns, the offer will be made again, but this time to Jew and Gentile alike. By belief and baptism, all people can be cleansed and purified and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me, whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. The Jews are still God's special people but they are not yet completely in favour with God. 
when they do return, a new household of faith will be created from people of all nations, not just Israel. Earlier on, we mentioned that Jerusalem was such a troubled place as it was being fought over by three religions. Well, unlikely as it might seem to some, the future of the world is to be decided at Jerusalem, because it is there that Christ will reign as king. That was the promise the angel Gabriel made to Mary, the mother of Jesus, when she was told she was to give birth to the Son of God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. The throne of David was in Jerusalem. It was there he reigned over Israel in about 1000 BC. From that city, kings ruled for over 400 years until the kingdom was lost. But the prophets of God were insistent on two things. The kingdom will return to Jerusalem, and it will be ruled over by a marvellous king. That king will be the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will make Jerusalem the centre of the world, which will give praise and glory to God. The world would at last become a fit place for God's people to live in, as God had always intended it should be. Just what this world will be like can be understood by piecing together the various pictures the prophets painted of the glorious future of Jerusalem. As we look at them, bear in mind that if you want to be part of this wonderful future, you have to do something about it now. Only through belief and baptism can we hope to share in this kingdom. You will arise and have mercy on Zion, for the time to favour her. Yes, the set time has come. So the nations shall fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. It shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. The nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem have a great future in store. When the Jewish people accept their true king, the Lord Jesus Christ, it will signal the end of war and the beginning of peace. People who live under the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ will be privileged to see the world run as it really should be. Those who have prepared now through faith and baptism will be given eternal life. Those who have now died but also chose to follow Jesus will be resurrected just as he was and also share in this kingdom. Jew and Gentile are destined to find their true place together at the close of this age and the start of the new one which is to come. Be sure that you are preparing for it now, before it's too late.